Is that going to work? OK. Uh, my name is Amos Libby. I have been living and working in the southern West Bank in Hebron, uh, specifically living in a village called Beit Umar for extended periods of time for about the last four years or so. My first interest in going to the West Bank was to experience what is certainly, in my mind, the premier human rights catastrophe of our time personally, so that I could speak about it from a position of experience, but also to be of service there. So when I live there, when I'm working there, I'm working as a teacher, uh, both of English language and also of Arabic music, believe it or not. Um, the first thing usually to suffer under occupation is the arts. And Arab culture around the Arabic-speaking world and in the West Bank is really... Um, it, the spoken word, the written word, music, poetry, this is something that's central. And uh, being able to bring music there um, that has been stifled uh, in a lot of ways uh, by the occupation, and also to be able to bring a view of this part of the world and the reality there and our unique place in it back here has been the goal uh, that I've had in traveling there uh, over and over again over the last few years. So I don't have anything planned to say uh, I will be speaking. Uh, Bob said that I was a renowned speaker. I'm not sure who has renowned me, but um, I'll be speaking about the images that I'll share with you. There's a lot of them. I don't know how many I'll be able to get through, um, but I would like to just show you a little bit of, uh, of, the, of the open window into the life that I've experienced there, which is quite different than many of the Western folks that I know that have traveled to the West Bank because it's completely unregulated. I'm self, uh, I speak Arabic fluently. Um, I'm not part of a group and I'm typically in places that most people don't go or really know exist. So I'm really excited to be able to show them to you. Although a lot of what folks have said already, um, I will be showing you images that will back up what they've said. And it was great to listen to everybody talk about your experiences. So thanks for having me here again, Bob. So probably most people have seen this map. So I'm not exactly, I don't think I need to teach a history lesson on exactly what's happened in the West Bank. Also, I want to make sure that we don't forget to talk about Gaza because a lot of times in discussion about the West Bank, the exclusion of Gaza by Israel has actually been very effective in discussions about Palestine uh, among Western people too. So anytime that we're discussing Palestine, we have to make sure that we are talking about Gaza as well. Um, there is no psychological difference to Palestinian people between the West Bank and Gaza. It's just Palestine. So um, we know the context that we're working in here. Um, something also that I wanted to say uh, before I go on with this, this journey is that we're all here because we care about Palestine. I think a lot of people here already know a great deal. So I'm not sure how much I can tell you that you don't know already. But something that I think many of us might have come into contact with attitude-wise when we talk about our activism for Palestine or our interest in human rights in Palestine is, well, why Palestine? What about um, Rwanda? What about Darfur? What about Saudi Arabia? What about our own government that perpetrates horrific human rights abuses around the world for profit every day? These are all things that we need to pay attention to. But the implication, and it's a common argument for pro-Israel, anti-Palestine people, is to try to convince you that it's not okay to care about Palestine until every other problem in the world has been solved. So for example, uh, US Grammy-winning pop star Lord uh, decided not to perform in Tel Aviv as part of an artistic boycott. And she got, of course, an incredible amount of backlash. Principle among these, the backlash is well, you're performing in Russia, and what about Russia? What about the things that they do? This is terrible, right? But the liberation and the equal human rights of the Palestinian people is not required to wait for every other problem in the world to be solved. It doesn't have to be deferred until everything else is fixed. We can confidently work on this, this problem while not refusing to acknowledge that the rest of the world has a lot of other problems that have to be worked on too. And there are people doing that. So I'm really pleased to see people here that aren't afraid to care about this part of the world because we've been told not to for most of our lives. So this is me. Uh, I'm an oud player. If we have time today, I'll play for you a little. Uh, it's an 11-stringed uh, Middle Eastern lute. Um, these are my friends. Um, the guy in the blue shirt next to the window, his name is Sultan. He's my best friend. I live with him in the West Bank with his family in Beit Umar. Um, next to me 
Uh, next to my elbow is Muhammad Abu Ayash. And Muhammad is an amazingly talented graphic designer. Uh, there's three lawyers in that circle. Actually, the rest of them are all lawyers. <laughs> yeah. Um, this is a, uh, an illegally, according to the state of Israel, an illegally built hut in a cabbage field um, that we hang out in when it's wintertime at night because we have that stove. Um, and I play songs and we eat sweets and drink juice and spend our evenings like that, usually punctuated by gunfire coming from uh, soldiers from the Al-Arub refugee camp, which is close by. This is the night sky from my bedroom in Beit Umar. I just wanted to share this because it was beautiful. So what we're looking at now are some viewpoints from the entrance to the West Bank village of Beit Umar, which is about 12 kilometers north of Hebron, or Al-Khalil in Arabic, and about 20 minutes south of Bethlehem. The city, or the village as we refer to it, has about 18,000 people in it, and it's an area C, which is completely controlled by the Israeli military. The dubious distinction that Beit Umar has is being home to the highest sniper tower, Israeli sniper tower in the West Bank, which is what we're looking at here. Uh, there's a, a small uh, military base at the foot of that tower, and to do anything, we have to pass by this tower. And as you can see, these military installations at the entrance to Palestinian villages, they squeeze the entrances so that only one lane of traffic can go in and out. And that's because typically they set up flying checkpoints, which are movable checkpoints, at these military installations on a daily basis, depending on what time of day it is. So if we look at the bottom left, uh, sorry, the bottom right picture, we can see people waiting for taxis, uh, waiting for buses that, that go by to go into Hebron or into Bethlehem where people work. Um, and they're confronted with this horrible tower bristling with weapons. I know three people that have been killed um, by live ammunition fired from that tower while standing directly where I took that photograph. The top right is a view of Route 60, which is the road that, if you know, many of us have seen this road that is typically known as the Jerusalem to Hebron Highway. It's uh, the Holy Road, one of the most uh, sort of holy roads in the world that passes through Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron, uh, from the north part of the West Bank all the way to the south. Someone mentioned a, an iron gate. Um, that was out. Someone mentioned an iron gate uh, keeping someone uh, in and out of their, their farmland. This is a gate that you see at the entrance to every single Palestinian village in the West Bank. These are uh, installed by the Israeli military in order to, at any time, completely stop any and all traffic entering or exiting villages in the West Bank. The Israeli army can close down every single Palestinian village in the occupied West Bank in about 45 minutes. And one of the major ways that they do that is very simple technology like a giant, ugly iron gate. And this is also something that is closed on a regular basis. Uh, I've seen it closed probably 60 or 70 times since I've been there. I'm showing you this, um, this photograph because this is a photograph of my friend. His name was Hisham. He was the head of the Defense of Children International, which is a, a very active uh, social organization in the West Bank. Um, concerned with working with Palestinian children who have been traumatized by proximity to Israeli military installations and other violent uh, trauma, uh, primarily caused by the Israeli army. Hisham was shot and killed while I was uh, in Beit Umar for the first time in 2014 by an Israeli sniper from the tower that I showed you the photograph of at the beginning of this presentation. Hisham had three children. This is a billboard that is uh, on the street um, in Beit Umar, very close by to where he was killed and only about 100 feet from his house. He was a really, really great guy. He could eat more than anyone I've ever met in my life. <laughs> he viewed it as a competitive exercise, and I always lost, but I enjoyed the competition. I miss him very much. This is a, I, this is a car dashboard with a shopping bag on it, but I took this photograph waiting for um, a taxi to teach in the school that I teach in in Hebron um, about three weeks ago or so. Seeing Israeli soldiers, heavily armed Israeli soldiers, uh, outfitted as if they are going into combat somewhere uh, is it a common thing for every resident of every Palestinian village doing something as normal as waiting for a ride to work. Somebody mentioned the signs um, 
that, yes, that was you, correct? I forgot your name. Christy. These signs are placed at the entrance, this is the entrance of Beit Umar. These signs are placed at the entrance to every Palestinian village. Uh, we can all see what it says in Hebrew, Arabic, and in English. To give the impression that these towns, these villages, are incredibly hazardous places for Israelis to be. It's really important to recognize that Israelis are essentially not in danger anywhere in the West Bank. There are attacks that happen, they're very infrequent, but Israelis travel on segregated roads for the most part, are protected by a regional military superpower with mechanized infantry, tanks, armored personnel carriers, rifles, concussion grenades, 40, 40 millimeter anti-personnel rounds, the most horrifying weaponry that we've ever developed as people, protect every single Jewish person that travels through the West Bank. Yet they put these signs underneath a sniper tower used to shoot Palestinians. Right behind that is the sniper tower that I showed you a picture of. Who's really in danger in this place? It's very clear to those of us that have spent time in the West Bank who is really at risk because of the situation there. And these are the signs that uh, often folks on the other side of this argument will say, well, you know, you're accusing Israel of apartheid, but, you know, we're not allowed to go into certain parts of the West Bank. These are put up by the Israeli government. When I was there a few weeks ago, one of my students from Bates, who is a Jewish American who has uh, a lot of family in Israel, he happened to be visiting, and I said, Ezra, come visit me. Come to Beit Umar, which is a real hotbed of resistance. And he's, he's very pro-Palestine, not afraid. I brought him to the village. Everybody knew where he was from, who he was. And the most dangerous thing was probably gaining weight because we ate so much and drank so much sweet tea. So this is propaganda. It's Hasbara. This is propaganda. It's not, the kind of, it's not a symmetrical conflict. When we use that word conflict, we're, we're actually implying that there is two equal, there's two equal sides that are fighting when we're actually dealing with a military superpower and an oppressed indigenous minority that have no state, no borders, no military. So we know where the danger lies, at least those of us that have been there. This, so what I'm doing is I'm kind of traveling along roads with this presentation. Uh, this is a place where, uh, this is the entrance to a village called Halhul, which is directly south of Beit Umar on the way to Hebron. Halhul is also in Area C, so completely controlled by the Israeli military. And this checkpoint was set up probably about 70% of mornings that I would go to work. And this same soldier singled me out every single time to demand to know what I was doing there, if I was Muslim, if I spoke Arabic, um, why I spoke Arabic, why I was there, and asked me probably five or six times, why would you want to teach these people? This is not uncommon. This is a view of the city of Hebron. Um, we heard from, and I cannot believe I forgot your name already, Kathy. Kathy, about the Ibrahimi Mosque and the nature of the fractured existence in Hebron, and I'm going to get into that a little. Um, this is Abraham's Grove. These are ancient olive trees above the city. So we're traveling south now, and we're in Hebron, where the school that I teach at is. It's called the Excellence Center. It's on Ein Sara, which is the main street in the city. This is the Ibrahimi Mosque. This is the reason for uh, Jewish colonization and settlement inside the city of Hebron. In 1968, the first extremist Jewish settlers arrived in Hebron, posing as tourists from Brazil, and rented the two top floors of the Hebron Hotel and refused to leave. And those settlements have grown into the most dangerous extreme settlements in the West Bank and turned Hebron into ground zero for the military occupation of Palestine. This mosque, we heard from Kathy about the uh, massacre that occurred there. So we've learned a little bit about the impetus of the partition into what's called H1 and H2, two sections of Hebron under the Hebron Protocols in 1997 that created an enclave for violent extremist settlers um, in the smack in the middle of the largest Palestinian settlement in the, sorry, Palestinian city in the West Bank. Um, a particularly horrific thing happened to me right here uh, from this, this view, which I'll, I'll get into uh, a little later. So to get into that area where the mosque is, 
you have to go through several different checkpoints. This is the main checkpoint. And at this checkpoint, this is called Checkpoint 60. And this is in a place called Baba Zawiya, or the old city um, in, in Hebron. This checkpoint is the first place that I saw Israeli soldiers shooting at Palestinian children. And that was in 2014 um, during the war in Gaza, and the responses to that in the West Bank were crushed very violently. I saw eight to nine-year-old children getting shot at from right here. Uh, the horse was comfortable in this spot. I wasn't. Um, this is a checkpoint that you have to pass through uh, repeatedly to get into the um, Tel Rameda area of the city, which is a, a very, very violent uh, settlement where some of my friends live. And I think I have the view next of, this is another image uh, a little further back that I wanted to share. So when you pass that checkpoint, this would be your view uh, on the left-hand side. This um, is looking down this hill to the epicenter of Jewish settlement in the old city called Beit Hadassah. What we're looking at here is as far as Palestinians are allowed to go, without being shot and killed on site. If past that last green awning, um, no one, that very, very few Palestinians that have proper identification are allowed to travel past that spot. If anybody else does, they're not asked any questions, they're shot uh, immediately. And we heard about businesses that had been closed after the massacre and doors welded shut. These metal doors in front of these businesses are all uh, welded shut by the Israeli army. On the right-hand side, on the top, uh, this, is, this was about a month ago, I was walking to visit a friend, and this is a very familiar scene inside the old city. These are Jewish settlers that just felt like going for a walk. And they're being escorted by, um, I think it was about 15 heavily armed soldiers. This is what I meant by saying that when Jews want to travel on the West Bank, they're free to do so and are offered protection of essentially imperialist agents of colonization armed with high-powered rifles and grenades. Underneath um, is a view of one of the dozens of observation posts uh, that also function as defensive and firing positions for the garrison of Israeli soldiers that have been stationed in the old city to protect the settlers who are also armed that live um, in the upper floors mostly of buildings that have been stolen from Palestinians in the old city. And I think that I saw a photograph similar to this in uh, what Sally was, was scrolling through. These, uh, this is an example of some of the Palestinian homes that are still occupied by Palestinians, but they're only allowed to live on the upper floors, and their front doors are welded shut. So I actually met an 86-year-old woman that had to go in the window in the, behind her house to enter uh, her home. And they're forced to cover their balconies with these uh, cages to prevent having projectiles um, and other things thrown at them and from settlers scaling down the walls and entering their homes to destroy them or to assault them. Now, I know I'm going really quickly here. I'm doing the best I can. I think there's like 70 slides here. I won't get through all of them. But um, I hope that I'm making some sense. Are we following OK? OK, <laughs> great. This is the checkpoint leading into the Ibrahimi Mosque. Um, there is a military installation directly after it that's actually fairly new. Um, after this, the turnstiles, there is a garrison of soldiers that check everyone that's coming and going. And the Ibrahimi Mosque is a central place of worship for Palestinians. It's only after Al-Aqsa is there any place in the West Bank or in Palestine or almost anywhere in the world other than the two holy sanctuaries in Mecca and Medina that are more precious for Muslims from this part of the world. So to do something very simple, like travel to the mosque to pray, which is very, very important in the life of Muslims anywhere in the world, one has to pass through what feels like airport security um, in any sort of more draconian regime in the world. Freedom of movement is the first way that you can control people. 
right? So the Israelis have mastered it. The West Bank, and the most concentrated version of which is Hebron, is the most outrageously severe, restricted place as far as movement is concerned that you will see anywhere in the world. There is nowhere like this. The old city is filled with military installations and checkpoints like the one that you're seeing here, like the two that I've shown you already. These are only three or four of many, and there's new checkpoints every month, every month. This is an example of closed off areas of the old city. This, this is the home of um, Ubaid al-Hasham, who was a friend of mine who his house would be, if you were standing in this spot, his house is to your back. And in front of us, we're seeing a closed off area that's filled with garbage and razor wire. But on the roof on top are settler homes. So these extremist settlers have built these really quite nice looking timber frame dwellings on top of old concrete buildings. Hisham's wife, uh, she was pregnant this was about eight years ago, and she was up on the roof next to this budding settlement at the time, hanging laundry, and a settler didn't like seeing a Palestinian on the roof, so he shot her in the head. She was about eight months pregnant, and they were able to save the baby, but unfortunately were not able to save her. And about three years later, uh, he was a little boy. He was playing right there where that manhole cover is. And a group of settlers uh, ran down the alleyway and threw acid on his face. And he's disabled severely and still has to travel to Jordan periodically for treatment. These are not uncommon stories to hear. Uh, it sounds unbelievable, but it's everyday life in the old city of Hebron and in many other parts of the occupied West Bank. This is another example of closed off uh, areas in Hebron that used to be thriving markets. And this existence is resistance is a common refrain um, in this part of the West Bank. So this is more examples of barriers. And again, these were all very, very bustling market areas that were the premier place for commerce in the city. If you had a business here, you were doing really, really well. And Gutting the commercial center of the largest Palestinian city in the West Bank is a very effective tool of draining the strength from resistance. This is something important I wanted to share with you. This is a school. So uh, this is the last co-educational school in, in Hebron, in the old city. And this is the school sign on the bottom right. Um, on the top right, this in Arabic says, uh, we have the right to an education. And what you're looking at on the left is the playground of the school. And if you look behind it, there is a gun tower, an Israeli gun tower behind it that is used to watch these children all day long. So these kids are playing, and while they're playing, they're looking at armed soldiers at, in that tower that they know can shoot them with impunity and sometimes do. I'm fascinated with the idea of, of resistance in, in whatever form that takes. And in Hebron and all over Palestine, I think those of us that have been here can probably agree that using uh, graffiti, using street art as a way to promote uh, resistance is something that's very common. So this is in the new city, not the new city, excuse me, it's nothing new about, about Hebron. This is um, in the, the Palestinian part of the city, which is almost all of it. This is on Ein Sada on the main street. Inside that bird, it says water, and salt, which is a message of solidarity with hunger striking Palestinian political prisoners. And underneath it, it says revolution and dignity. And this fellow on the left side, um, in Arabic, that says until freedom. And I wanted to share these images with you. I think someone actually had a picture of this. Uh, this is back in the old city. 
Um, the settlers that occupy the upper floors, they throw stones, excrement, garbage um, on the Palestinian merchants that work um, and, and the businesses underneath where the settlements are. So they've been forced to erect these grates to protect themselves. And in some places, um, they have tarps up there as well because the settlers will throw urine, sewage, and sometimes acid on merchants. This is happening every day. So before we move on from Hebron, um, this is a colleague of mine. Her name is Saida Ali. She's from South Africa. Um, we walked to, to that spot that I showed, I showed you in front of the Ibrahimi Mosque, looking for um, a green space just to sit down. And when we arrived, uh, we had to pass through three checkpoints. They let her pass through. When we got close to the mosque, the soldiers um, that were stationed in front of the mosque told her, this is, you're a Muslim, I can tell by your name. No Muslims are allowed here, only, only Jews. He can go, but you can't, uh, because my first name is extremely Jewish. I'm not Jewish, but because Israelis uh, are, not all Israelis, but the Israeli governing structure is obsessed with ethnic identity and religious identity, because my name was Amos, that must mean I'm Jewish. So they said he can go, but you can't. And this wasn't to go inside. The mosque has been split, so part of the mosque has been turned into a synagogue. So I wasn't trying to go inside the synagogue. I wasn't trying to go anywhere other than this park to sit down at a picnic table with my friend. He said, she can't go there, but you can. But if you take a different route to get there, uh, maybe you can go. I'm thinking, maybe? So we did. We took the other route. We got to the park. We sat down, and about 30 seconds later, three soldiers approached us and said, we need to see your ID, looked at the ID, looked in her, talked on the radio and said, no, nope, you're a Muslim, you have to go. You can't be here. This is for Jews only. I said, I'm not Jewish. Does that mean I have to go? She said, the female soldier, she said, no, but she can't stay. So the proof is quite clear. It's not Jewish only. It's just no Muslims. And this was a park, a, just a park. And this is a 19-year-old woman who traveled from South Africa for the first time and comes from a country infamous for a history of apartheid, and this is the first time she told me that she's ever experienced being singled out because of her religion. It was a really difficult, heartbreaking thing to watch because my Palestinian friends are accustomed to this injustice. And this was the first time that Saida had experienced something like that. And if you look behind her head, there's another sniper tower right up on top. So all of this occurs in a context of a very brutal incremental repression. And that kid is just adorable. So we're going to move outside of the old city of Hebron. Um, this is a former student of mine. Her name is Insef. Insef lives in a part of Hebron called Kiryat Arba. Kiryat Arba is a Jewish settlement that was settled starting in 1968 and was home to Baruch Goldstein, who was the uh, Ibrahimi Mosque uh, massacre perpetrator. It's a, good, uh, it's a good way to see what the general attitude of the community in Kiryat Arba is, that they birthed or attracted a settler like that. It's a very extremist community. She lives um, this road that you're looking at that she's standing on, she's sitting in front of her home in the top right. That road is, all Palestinian traffic is banned. Palestinians aren't allowed to travel on that road. They can walk, but they can't drive. The families that live there are forced to carry everything that they need for their, for their homes, cooking gas, like the man that, I'm, that I pictured there is carrying a gas cylinder. Um, everything that Palestinians need, they have to carry on their backs. On this day, I was with Insaf and her 80-year-old grandfather, and I had to carry a, a heater for him for about a mile because it was really cold there this time of year. Um, this was my first trip. I've been to Palestine quite a bit, and I'd never been to Kiryat Arba before because I didn't really know anybody there. Uh, this was definitely the most insecure, unsafe, threatening environment that I've ever been in in my life. This is a Palestinian, sorry, an Israeli settler bus. These buses are allowed on this road, and Insaf is forced to walk almost a mile to catch taxis while watching buses filled with settlers travel freely to and from their homes, which we're looking at on the top right. The bottom right is a donkey. Why is that important? 
The donkey belongs to Insaf's grandfather, who was forced to ride the donkey to his farmland, which is um, about six kilometers away. He rides the donkey every day, and I, when I saw this donkey standing there, and I saw the car going by, a, a settler car, the image of the two together was something that I wanted to capture and to share. I did hear recently from Insaf that the army has told her grandfather that the donkey is no longer allowed, that Palestinians are only allowed to walk. They keep the donkey inside the house, so um, hopefully he's friendly and there will be a use for him now. This is my student, Ali. And I'm sharing Ali with you because, first of all, he's an amazing guy. Uh, everyone should know someone like him. He's 26 years old, and he's been shot five times with live ammunition in the last four years. In my life, I've met people that have experienced gun violence. Uh, as an American, it's almost impossible not to. Um, and as someone that's traveled around the world, I've met people that have experienced mechanized violence and conflict. Most people that I know that have been shot five times are soldiers or police officers, or drug dealers, or gangsters. This is a student, an engineering student, who has never picked up a gun in his life. He lives uh, just south of Hebron, in a place where protests are routinely and brutally crushed by uh, Israeli forces with live ammunition. So in order to voice his opinion, or to vent his frustration with living under occupation, he takes his life in his hands, and he's uh, one of the funniest people that I ever taught in my classes. Um, super smart guy, extremely brave, and very soft and compassionate. And he told me, when you go home, tell people that there are people like me here, that my experience is not unusual. And so I'm telling you about him. This is Ali. This is what a settlement looks like. Um, we saw some of this before. Um, I know I don't have a ton of time. How much more time do I have, Bob? Okay. So I'm just going to kind of skip through some of these to give you a, some clear views of things I think are important. So this is in Beit Jala. Has anyone here seen this road before? Some folks must have, right? Yeah, this is... a. Uh, a, a really perfect example of what segregated roads in the West Bank look like. I don't really know if this needs any further explanation. This is an Israeli-only road, which essentially means a Jewish-only road. This is a really uh, clear example of what the Israeli apartheid wall looks like. This is in Bethlehem, near Rachel's Crossing. I'm sure that many people in this room have seen this before. Um, if you haven't, this is a, a, a perfectly representative example of what the many, 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 many miles of, um, of apartheid wall uh, looks like in the West Bank. This is the Anastas family house. This is a Palestinian Christian house that was encircled by this wall in one day. Her kids went home, uh, went to school, and when they came home uh, in the afternoon, this wall was around their house. This is where the wall uh, bisects a cemetery, so even the dead are not allowed to be free. This is Rachel's Crossing. Now, I want to point something out. This little area here, that's a, it's a little trap door. And behind that door are soldiers. And they, I watched in December, I watched soldiers open that door and fire rifles at nine, ten-year-old children that were unarmed, um, approximately 50 meters from that door. So we all know that Trump has made a decision about Jerusalem. I think we probably all feel similarly to any decisions that Trump makes. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. Shortly after he made this announcement, protests broke out all over the West Bank, and this is one of them that I happen to be at. Uh, if you look way back in the background, you can see a large crowd of people approaching. Behind me is that wall we just looked at. And in preparation for the protest, which was entirely peaceful, this banner was put on the ground, and uh, you can obviously see the message here, and folks were to walk over it. Now, 
This is a video. Now, I would never show you guys like really graphic, really graphic stuff, um, but I need you to watch this again. If you notice where this soldier is firing, I looked at this video for weeks before I realized that there is a little child running away from him, and he's shooting at the child. He shoots him at his back as he's running away. If we look right behind that tree, Firing are tear gas canisters uh, and concussion. Oh, sorry, tear gas canisters and 40 millimeter anti personnel rounds, both of which are lethal and have been lethal. If that little boy had gotten hit in the back of the head with one of those canisters, he could be disabled or killed. When I saw that video, I, I, I filmed it, but I was really busy trying not to get shot. And I didn't actually see that he was shooting at this kid. And it was about two weeks ago, I was looking at these videos, putting this together, and I saw it, and I could barely even speak. Now, they're firing at people that are just standing still. Do you see anybody near them? It was hard for me to imagine what the threat was. I was standing right there. So it's difficult to make a case for um, these soldiers feeling threatened. These are some of the guys that I met later on that day that arrived to defend their friends um, with slingshots. And there was uh, live ammunition being used on that day. I wasn't there for that part. Uh, they used silenced 22 caliber rifles, so you don't know that there's live ammunition being used until your friend falls next to you. And this is what the youth of Palestine is forced to face these people with. If you can see the kid to the right has a gas mask with him as well. And to keep an eye on that child that's in the right hand side. This is that same child after getting a face full of tear gas. I spoke with him after this. And that is his report card in his hand. He was coming from the school in the refugee camp of Ida, which is right there next to this, to this, um, the wall. And this is the apartheid wall behind that tear gas. If any, has anyone here ever been tear gassed? Yeah, Ayman. Ayman, our friend from Gaza, is here. It's a very effective and terrible weapon. It is deadly for some people with respiratory illnesses, and for the rest of us, it is completely debilitating. I need to tell you this before, uh, if I run out of time, I just needed you to know that this happened and that I witnessed it. What you're looking at is a crowd of people that are trying to help the person that's in that car that has crashed. It, it crashed about 30 feet away from me. And it was a guy coming around the corner trying to get away from the soldiers because soldiers will often think that moving vehicles during clashes are, um, are, uh, have explosives in them. Um, I'm just going to leave that there for now. And they'll fire at the cars. And he panicked, and he sped, um, lost control of the car right next to where I took this photograph and slammed into that light post and bounced off of it. Um, it was a really violent crash, and because there were clashes going on, there were, if you can see, back on the right-hand side, there are uh, fluorescent orange vests, and those are Palestinian volunteer paramedics that are on the scene whenever there's these clashes or protests to assist anyone that gets shot by the soldiers. So they ran to this car immediately to try to help the person that was in it, and the response from the soldiers was to fire tear gas directly at the paramedics. 
And this is the beginning of that fire. They walked it from where the cloud is now. They walked the fire end to those guys with the orange vest directly, and the entire crowd was forced to leave and leave that guy in the car by himself. These are some of the rounds. Now, if I don't have anything else, if I can't tell you anything else, this is important to recognize. That's a 40 millimeter anti-personnel round. That's a tear gas canister. And in the bottom, you can see CTS stamped on it. That is a company called Combined Tactical Systems. They're based in Pennsylvania. They produce all of the tear gas and so-called riot dispersal weapons that the Israeli army uses on Palestinians in the West Bank. Every single bit is produced in the United States. It's part of our unique responsibility is to know our role in this. And about maybe a thousand feet away, I took this photograph of a mother and her daughter. And these are the contrasts that we see in the West Bank all the time. It's important to remember that normal life, beautiful, inspiring life is going on at the same time. It's not all clashes and tragedy because the spirit of the Palestinian people has only been made stronger by this. These are children facing soldiers in the village of Beit Umar on the same day that I took the images in Bethlehem. It was a long day. Okay, I've got five minutes left. Uh, this is my sister. Uh, we, that's what we call each other, Shruk. And this is my favorite kid in the world. I don't have kids of my own, but if I could guarantee that it would be like this kid, I would have, I'd have five of them right now. This is Mohammed. He is the jewel of my, my family that I live with there. He's the first grandchild an absolute precious kid who I said to him once, um, I was like, Muhammad, you speak Arabic better than me. And then in English, I don't know how he learned it, he said, yes. <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, man. He lives in Arub refugee camp, which is right down the street. Um, it's, and this is the blocked entrance to the refugee camp in another sniper tower. It's important to recognize that refugees in the West Bank have been refugees for 70 years, and they're still legally recognized as refugees. And they're still hoping to return. This is the view from little Muhammad's house. This is from his roof. This is what this child has to look at every day. This is from his house as well. So I'm going to end just with telling you something about Muhammad. This is his grandfather, Ibrahim, who is, um, he's been my, my guide and my patron in, in Palestine for the last few years. And his grandson, Muhammad, you know when we, have, when we have children in our lives, a lot of times adults will say, you know, the, the kid will be there, what does the cow say? You know, moo, right? For Muhammad, his family, after he was born, yeah, I was there when he was born a couple years ago, and this is the first time I've, I've seen him sort of like on his own steam and able to talk. And they say to him in Arabic, Muhammad, what does the soldier have? And he, in Arabic, I'll say, a rifle. That's great, and everyone will laugh. Well, what does, what does a soldier do? And he says, he shoots. And what does a soldier, who does a soldier shoot? He shoots the boys. And you can't hear something like that and not have it touch you in, a, in the deepest place that anything ever could. And this was one of the last nights that I was in Palestine. And there was, in this last trip, and there was a, a pretty serious storm outside. And Muhammad got up on the couch, and he was bouncing on the couch and looking out the window, and he froze. And he started to cry and started to panic. And he said, Grandfather, there's soldiers outside. There's army outside. And it was thunder. And Ibrahim stood up and looked out the window and took his head in his hands, and he very slowly kissed him on the forehead, and he said, Habibi, ma fi jesh. There's no army. And it took about an hour to calm him down. I have probably 50 more images, but we don't have time for that now. But if I can leave you with anything, it's to remember that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of Muhammad there in the West Bank and in Gaza. That a whole young, uh, uh, Palestine is a young place. The whole younger generation is growing up with this and we'll never know the results of this trauma and there is something that we actually can do about it. And it starts with being in a place like this and talking to each other. 
and listening to people that have been there and being patient and, and being loving with each other as we share a truth that's very difficult to hear for a lot of people and difficult to say to. So thank you so much for taking some time to hear what I had to say. Thank you.